salutations and a good evening to all my dudes and dudettes and others out there. You found yourself stumbling upon the yearly legendary event called the Alpha Awards. I hope you've had a magnificent year and perhaps you've played a game or two. Or maybe you watched some playthroughs on YouTube. But whichever category you fit into, we're here to celebrate. Both the upcoming year full of possibilities, but also some of the games 2021 brought to the table. While also taking a shorter look on the worst, most disappointing and most anticipated games this year. Followed by my personal top 10 list of games that I've played this year, not released per se. I've re-experienced some titles with my friends, but also tried out some new hotness, as you say. So sit tight, get yourself a nice beverage of choice, maybe some popcorn, and continue to enjoy the following award show. Searching for the worst game of 2021 was hard for once. Mainly due to me getting a full-time job as a software developing programmer. So I had less time to explore new games. So this will be a controversial pick for sure. I almost went with a game called Evil Inside, a capitalization of the hype surrounding PT and a lackluster short forgettable game. But no, no, the worst game of 2021 must be... Cyberpunk 2077. What? While the game technically released in the end of 2020, I wouldn't even consider that a finished game, and especially not when taking consoles into consideration. It's very clear that CD Projekt Red lied and pushed the game out despite most definitely knowing it was unfinished, and my guess would also be that they had to cut a lot of content to actually make it somewhat function. Well, at least it won't crash. Well, shit. It is playable today, but personally I won't ever play it. Unless it goes on a massive sale. Because I don't enjoy being lied to. Especially when it also has with my spending to do. My personal money. A lot of people talk about this amazing atmosphere and world building that the game has. And I agree, it does have those things to a certain extent. But at the same time, what good is a world if it's not coherent and with few things to do in it? It feels void of life, many similar NPCs, choices not mattering and cops straight up teleporting, many features not implemented or straight up not functioning. It's not wrong to play and enjoy it, do as you like, but personally this stuff is so damn irritating. The most frustrating part is the continued lies and not acknowledging the missing features that were promised. I feel bad for the developers crunching to get this out, but I'll never feel bad for the corporate part of this whole shitfest. Although I've gotten a ton of enjoyment from watching bug compilations and extended reviews on YouTube, so I guess it's not all that bad. But it always hurts when you think about what could have been. This year had a massive amount of disappointing or straight up lackluster games. All the way from Back 4 Blood to Diablo 2 Resurrected. Fuck! Fuck this shit! Came in this but this choice or pick isn't any of them. Instead, this is the one that hurts me personally. One of the collections I looked forward to with childish glee was the master collection of the infamous Ninja Gaiden games. I remember vividly when I was 11 to 12-ish years old and my uncle introduced me to Ninja Gaiden on the Xbox. And even though it was frustratingly hard, I loved it. And I managed to beat even very hard mode in due time, currently halfway through Master Ninja mode. This collection was price worthy for what I originally thought were included, but here is where the disappointment began. There are some nice additions like more costumes for Rachel in the first game, as well as other costumes included, and in the second and third game, traditional Chinese is available. But this entire collection feels very rushed. The games are all based on the Sigma versions, the lesser versions. I read that the original source code for the black version has been lost, and thus they chose the Sigma version of the first game. 
They also could have easily included the choice whether to include Rachel's chapters in the first game or not, so you had a choice. And the cutscenes just look... <laughs> For whatever idiotic reason, the second and third game lacks all forms of multiplayer modes, a big chunk of the enjoyment just stripped away, and the PC port has no graphical options on release day. And the aiming in the first game? Hello Nintendo? What the fuck is this aiming? Overall I'm just extremely disappointed in what ultimately could have been such a fantastic collection of games. I also need to mention the atrocious GTA, and I'm saying this Loosely, definitive edition. The only reason I didn't have it as my choice is that I never assumed it to be a good remaster in the first place. And by god, it was and still is a complete disaster. What's happening to game companies, man? I need to switch to indie studios instead. At least they have passion and integrity. This one is basically self-explanatory and I'll keep it short. Elden Ring, from what little I've seen of it, seems to be the best of everything when it comes to Souls games, incorporating some of this and some of that from the games that came before it. I've avoided, on purpose, looking at trailers, because I want to get the full blind experience when I play it this February, on release. So SMASH THAT SUB BUTTON and get ready for some sick ass playthroughs of the game. Both one without voice and one voiced. Not much else to say, I'm just hyped as fudge for Elden Ring. And that takes care of all the special mentions. So on to the main top 10. I started out 2021 by doing the impossible. I gained 200 IQ and I went back in time all the way to 2009 in order to fully re-experience a classic RPG, Dragon Age Origins. After a long journey through Dragon Age Inquisition for the second time, I wanted to play Origins and see if it was as good as I remembered it to be. And it was. It was so good, in fact, that I decided to make a video analyzing and recommending the game to my viewers. The only reason this game is this far up is that I couldn't wait to tell you how fantastic it is. Even though the graphics is starting to show its age, the depth of combat, role playing and replayability with an obscene amount of outcomes makes this a game well worth your pennies. There are so many details, everything you may see along the road when traveling to different locations, the huge amount of background lore of the Templars, Blood Magic, the Fade, the High Dragons, and more obscure details as well. Hours just disappear when playing the game, but it always ends up with you wanting more and more. I'm truly looking forward to whatever Dragon Age 4 turns out to be, or whenever, if at all, it will release. But I'm stuck with the thought that maybe Dragon Age Origins was the highest peak the series were ever going to reach. I so do hope that I'm proven wrong. It's hard to sell the brilliance of Origins in such a low amount of words, but I urge you, if you like tactical RPGs or fantasy in general, Dragon Age Origins simply cannot be overlooked. Jumping from a huge AAA quality game like Dragon Age, we instead focus on a smaller creation. I've been eyeing this game ever since it released and caught my attention with its grandiose style and fantastic soundtrack. The planets aligned, I took the leap during one of Steam's massive summer sales. The game called Katana Zero is a neo-noir platform that takes place in a dystopic metropolis called New Mecca. The game's plot heavily revolves around the aftermath of an event called the Chromag War, where an unnamed nation invaded New Mecca. The protagonist was a participant in this war. This is one of those types of games that gives you a small increments of information, both surrounding the lore as well as important characters. Gameplay-wise, you get assassination contracts from your psychiatrist. Totally normal. 
And in return, Zero is rewarded by a drug called Kronos, which allows him to slow down time and predict the future. You play screen by screen and it's a one hit kill game, but it also opens room for exploration with its mechanics, what shenanigans Zero can do. It sounds absolutely crazy, and it kinda is, but in the best way. Throughout the game, Zero will experience hallucinations and vivid nightmares, but we also get an inside look into his daily life as an amnesiac. The whole game is just jarring, and messes with your mind any chance it gets. There's a large focus on storytelling and trying to piece everything together is tricky, but satisfying when it all clicks. I remember I was sick when I played through it. I had a massive headache and a spinning head, and let me tell you, that's something I very much won't recommend. But otherwise, solid, pure fun. Going through Dark Pictures, Man of Medan, after fully completing Until Dawn, was a harsh experience. While it started out in the same vein as its predecessor, it quickly unveiled its true colors and ultimately fell flat on its ass, as it became clear the characters, the plot, the mystery and the lore wasn't anywhere near the level that Until Dawn provided. This was turned around yet again, when myself and two of my buddies gathered to try out the new creation of Supermassive Games, full name being Dark Pictures Anthology Little Hope. The game once again features a similar setup with a new set of diverse characters with strengths and flaws, a short but horrifying introduction and questionable events during the game. This time, the characters you play as seem to have their own personal demons, and it's also somehow linked to the past of the town Little Hope. This is then expanded upon as you progress and the puzzle gets a bit clearer as you do. Although it falters every now and then during the events of the game, the experience as a whole was a good one, with a personally satisfying ending. It wasn't a masterclass of horror games like Until Dawn was to classic horror slashers, but it captured some of the essence which made Until Dawn such a blast to play partly through the movie night mode and general couch gameplay improvements. We started playing House of Ashes recently, during our Halloween-ish game nights, and it has a strong start, so maybe that will make an entry the next year, who knows. You know, this recent year, or more accurately, year and a half, I've been enjoying something I'd never heard of before, something that I was highly skeptical of first. A game that was made back in 2008, Wizard 101. I've never been the biggest fan of MMOs or MMORPGs, and while it took a while for me to get into it after I'd played Wizard 101 for a time, it grew on me. Something akin to an imagined nostalgia combined with the way you get to pick a master magic school make your own character, and venture to different worlds, doing quests, and watering plants. <laughs> At the surface level it sounds basic, but the gameplay of Wizard 101 is deceptively deep. Throw in pets that may assist you or boost you in battle, special events such as the Yuletide or spin-offs of classics such as Sherlock... Bones? You can tell that the developers King Isle Games made this with passion first and foremost, with the players at the front. The only real negative I have to mention is that while the game is free to play, it's also quite heavily monetized, with packs, bundles, boosts, and a monthly fee, or yearly depending on what you prefer. And I'm mostly against these practices. I think if you're like me and my partner, mostly playing events and PvE story, it's fine. But I don't know how it is with PvP and other aspects of the game. The game has brought me joy and I've had a lot of fun playing it. Experimenting with different schools of magic and spells and playing with my SO. I hope it will continue in the same vein going forward and I recommend you checking it out yourself. This next game has definitely not been on last year's Alpha Awards list. And if you claim otherwise, I don't know what you're talking about. 
Seeing as my playthrough of Neo 2 was never finished, I decided on a whim and due to seeing it was fresh. What do I owe you? Nothing. It's for free. <gasps> free! I, I just had to replay the entire game again. And I'm glad I did. Also, Neo 2 Remastered is of course a completely different game from the original. And that's why it's on here. As I had access to all available DLCs this time around, I was also able to get new items, armors, weapons and weapon styles. I also noticed a notable improvement to the resolution, FPS and overall quality of life improvements. Since I luckily got a PS5 earlier this year, I got to play it on that instead of the PS4, which is like night and day when it comes to performance. This time I finished the entire story and after some grinding, I even managed to 100% the base game, getting the Platinum Trophy in the process. The biggest improvements with Neo 2 is the custom character creation, the addition of yokai abilities and added depth when it comes to combat. Overall, I had a blast playing Neo 2 again, and although I decided not to play the DLCs, I'm satisfied with the base game ending and I think it closed on a good note. If you have the urge to play something similar or can be considered a mix between Onimusha and Ninja Gaiden and Diablo, Neo 2 Remastered is the game for you. Quite surprising that we're at spot 5 already, and what's even more surprising is that this year, no Persona game will rank higher on my list than this. Persona 5 Strikers is a fun Warriors-esque twist on the normally turn-based Persona formula. It follows the Phantom Thieves after the events of Persona 5, not Persona 5 Royal, and the game considers the original Persona 5 to be canon, unfortunately. But this isn't the biggest sin that Persona 5 Strikers commits. The three biggest sins I can remember off the top of my head is too much flashes and special effects, potentially blinding you while in the heat of battle largely rewarding spam gameplay, and finally, even though I enjoyed some events with the team, you know, hanging out with other members of the Thieves, a lack of social game, something that has always been put at the center of any Persona game beforehand, at least main games. That said, I really enjoyed the variety of the locations, and that the game features traveling all over Japan. Finding unique dishes from each region or other specialties, having a few wholesome moments with some callbacks to the OG Persona 5, and the new characters are fascinating and well written. Using personas, creating setups, leading into different combinations, and using each character's unique combat style is also another point in favor of P5S. In conclusion, the game is bold to try something almost entirely new but it never even comes close to the tops of the main games when it comes to content, interesting gameplay and fond memories, which is why it ultimately lands on the 5th spot in this list. Four for 4 Back in 2001, PlayStation was on a roll with classic after classic and their newest console, the PlayStation 2 selling like hotcakes. Ever since playing the demo discs on the PlayStation 1, you know, the ones, I've been enamored with Crash Bandicoot, and I was really hoping that the Wrath of Cortex would be the legendary series big step into the new era, but alas, I was wrong. Not only did it have eternity lasting load screens, one eternity later, the game felt sluggish and unpolished. The music and intent was good, but the final product lacked what made Crash crash. Fast forward to last year, October 2020, BOOM! And after much anticipation following a huge downward trajectory with all Crash Bandicoot games, Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time was released. God damn, this game is good. The plot this time around directly follows the events of Crash 3 Warped, with N Cortex and N Trophy, you know, N Trophy, being stuck in the past with Uka Uka, and much to everyone's surprise, they manage to escape. What follows is a multiverse based adventure with a plethora of time based inspirations and levels. You get to choose between crashing Coco normally 
but with levels thrown in here and there where you can play as M. Cortex, Tona from another dimension, and f***ing Dingodile. <laughs> Dingodile. It's a fantastic game with lots of callbacks, inventive levels, quantum masks to spice up gameplay mechanics, and many, many hours of pure platforming perfection. The only things I dislike with this game is the quote-unquote alternate flipped stages, as well as what I consider to be cheap box placements. You know, where you can't see the box itself and you have to guess. I don't really like that, but aside from that, it's a very nice game. I hope we'll see more of the Bandicoot in the years to come. The series has so much potential after all. If you've ever been on the internet this recent year, it's very plausible you've come across the wave of simps on either Twitter, in articles or wherever they crawl out from. But this time they aren't simping for Pokemon, but instead for the Queen of Vampires, Dimitres, from the latest installment in the famous horror series Resident Evil 8 Village. When creating Dimitres, the scientists at Capcom looked at Elizabeth Bathory, but decided to modernize her design a bit. They put the early 20s aged intern behind the wheels, which then proceeded to amp her proportion sliders to 300%. Then they hacked Bloodborne and put Papa G in as the leader of the werewolves. But I stayed out of the simp movement, while also dodging spoilers like Neo from The Matrix. And as a result, got to experience the game entirely blind, mostly through streaming and screaming. <coughs> Yokes, put aside for a bit, it's clear that Capcom is going the FPS route with the future main games, while keeping the remakes to the third person view. I'm also glad they keep experimenting with varying locations, stories and characters. It's fun to do the survival horror charade all over in the new era of gaming. It's just so addicting and it seems the formula never gets old. For a while there, it seemed like Capcom was almost slipping and that they didn't know what to do with their flagship games. But after playing Resident Evil 8 Village, it seems like they found their footing again. Village can be described as a successful continuation of Resident Evil 7 and it easily gets put as my third spot on best games this recent year. It is unfortunately rare nowadays for me to genuinely smile when I play video games. It happens that I pop a smirk every now and then, but full-blown smiles are extremely rare. What did make me smile, almost the entire 10 to 12 hours, was Team Asobi's latest creation, Astro's Playroom. Don't be fooled from the description that Astro's Playroom is a quote-unquote tech demo. This is a fantastic love letter to the entire journey of PlayStation, all the way from the PS1 in 1994 the best year, by the way, with no contentions, okay? Okay. The game has this hub world where you can find hidden puzzle bits and references to famous games or characters. Then you can also play through four very different themed worlds, capped off by an optional boss fight that, without spoiling too much, takes you on a callback to earlier days. Everywhere therein, you can find hidden puzzles, platforming parts, cool sections showcasing the absolute genius of the new DualShock controller, where you can feel rain grip on the Astrobot, or when it's hard to pull the triggers because the bot is pulling a bowstring and god, there's just so much stuff here. The biggest surprise is how extremely polished and well made the game is. We already have a recipe for a masterpiece creation, but want to know the final and best part of it all? You wanna know what it is? The game is F. R E E E Free Free No money Free No money needed to play it. It comes installed on the console when you get it. Damn. This entire game is a knockout home run, and it undoubtedly proves that games can still be works of art, passion and dedication. From now on, I'm following Team Asobi with a keen eye full of excitement for their next adventure.
In comparison to these last years, my plate has been over encumbered with stuff that has happened, my work and my career, life and an overall lack of time. I have a place for one honorable entry, a game that I put off for way way too long, a little game called Monster Hunter World. There's so much in this game that speaks to me, and I'm also one for enjoying simpler setups with deeper gameplay elements for the ones that wants to perfect their gameplay style. Going out for hunts, researching and crafting new gear from the materials you get, exploring new areas, finding seemingly hidden ones and learning more about each monster is satisfying incarnate. The game is just stellar, and me buying it for roughly $15 doesn't hurt either. The final bonus is that my partner also likes it and we've had some fun finding new monsters or techniques together. You know, the number one choice has almost never been this easy. Although it released in 2020, technically, I've not gotten to play it for this year. It's a game I've been looking forward to for a long time and I've already finished it thrice. And if it wouldn't be for online trophies, I would have had another one, Platinum Trophy that is, in my collection. The most polished, the game that really showcased the next generation of gaming and what comes with it, it's motherfucking Demon Souls Remake. It's <laughs> Damn! Look at this beauty of a game. When I first saw the trailer, I, th I thought my eyes were deceiving me, okay? It looked like something I imagined video games looked like when I was a kid, plus more. I was so, so afraid of another Dark Souls 2 degrade situation, but luckily I was wrong. I know I've overused the world polished before, but holy smokes, this is a polished game. And we all have blue point games to thank for it. I wish they were in charge of the Dark Souls remaster as well. Every crevice, every detail has been recreated in amazing detail. Gameplay has been modernized while still retaining the spirit of the original game, and some additional content has been added. But not so much that it takes away from the overall experience, or takes away anything really. I played through the first time, quote unquote, blind, with my usual warrior esque plus faith build, and the second and third playthroughs were a magic user and a katana edgelord, respectively, having a blast the entire time. I loved every single minute playing through this demon, and savored every moment. I'm certain this isn't the last time I've played either. If you really want to hear about my personal thoughts and experiences, what I think about the game in detail, be sure to check out my video on the remake. The Demon's Souls remake was the best, most fun and most enjoyable game I played this year, without a doubt, and it showcases the potential of future video games and consoles, a future I'm looking forward to with a shivelish glee. Thank you Demon's Souls. And there we have it, another year tightly wrapped up in a little bag. From the worst offenders to the best additions, we've probably all experienced or played some new games maybe gain a new friend or two and hopefully had something good happen to us. I always like doing these and I truly appreciate every viewer, every second watched. So to everyone out there, to all my friends, to anyone watching, thank you very much and have a happy new year. See ya.